My name is Dr. Biken Sipilian, and I am a uh, uh, member of the executive board of the Armenian American Medical Society, and I'm the chairman of the Continuing Medical Education uh, Committee of the AMS. Um, I'm proud to say that, you know, I'm working, we are working uh, very closely together to bring to you, to our members, uh, and any other uh, participants, uh, the, the educational expert series um, that will exchange the latest knowledge that we have available to us on the COVID-19 uh, global pandemic. We have two specialists today, one uh, from New York City and one who is locally. Um, the two uh, experts are Dr. Tsolin Kojalanyan and Dr. George Melikian. Um, uh, Dr. Kojalanyan is going to be our first speaker. Uh, Tsolin Kojalanyan is a graduate of the uh, American University of Beirut. She uh, did her residency in pediatrics at SUNY uh, Upstate New York, State University of New York followed by doing her fellowship in pediatric uh, infectious diseases um, in Montefiore, again, in New York. She graduated her fellowship in 2006. She is a, she's double board certified in pediatrics and pediatrics infectious diseases. And currently she is at Maimonides Children Hospital in New York City. Tolene and I have been in touch uh, du during this global pandemic, and she's been gracious enough to keep contact with us on, a, on almost a daily basis. She is truly at ground zero. She is in one of those hospitals where we see on the news where the, they have many, many uh, admitted patients and many patients and healthcare uh, workers that are being impacted by this. She is on the advisory boards at the hospital level and is very much ingrained in setting up the protocols. And, um, and she also has been gracious enough to uh, really make herself available as we organize some of these similar type of educational telementoring webinars to train doctors in Armenia. Solin has made herself available at, at uh, all times of day to make sure that we uh, transfer this information to anyone uh, globally who is who may benefit from this. With that, I'd like to turn over the uh, the, the podium to Dr. Kojalanyan, who's going to tell us the latest on the COVID-19 from ground zero in New York City. I wanted to, uh, obviously there's a lot to cover in COVID-19. We wanted to make sure that we give participants as much of an information as Dr. Sepilian said, updated as of today. As we know, the information is evolving and every day there are new recommendations based on new data that's being gathered. And that's wonderful because we are learning as we go with this virus. Uh, and uh, I just want to say that, as Dr. Sepilian mentioned, we are uh, unfortunately the epicenter of the United States, and we have been for the past few weeks. Just from our own hospital, we have, have had 100 deaths, um, uh, but we have also discharged 300 people uh, who have done well, and we have had about 1,000 admitted adult patients in our hospital alone. Um, and I will also focus today, since I'm a pediatric infectious disease specialist, on the pediatric component and our experience and the published experience as well, together with uh, the transmission of uh, this virus and what we can do and why we are doing all the measures we are doing to prevent this infection. I have nothing financial to disclose. So just a quick uh, review of what this uh, disease is. This uh, was termed COVID-19. Uh, it was the disease that was, that, uh, that was discovered or first known about in late uh, December, but now we know that early November was probably the first case in China. And the virus, uh, once it was identified, 
identified and sequenced, it was found to be very uh, close in structure to the SARS uh, co coronavirus that was circulating about 10 years ago and caused disease in certain countries. And therefore, this virus was named the SARS-CoV-2 virus, meaning number two, because number one was, as I said, the, the one uh, about a decade ago. And this disease was declared a pandemic not too long ago, exactly, probably not even a month ago, on March 11, 2020. It feels like ages ago. So uh, this is an animal virus that was previously not identified in humans, and it jumped to humans and is now uh, basically passing on from one person to another. There is no doubt about that. However, because this virus is a brand new virus to human beings, and that's why it was called the novel coronavi coronavirus, that means that us human beings have never seen this virus before, have never been exposed to this virus before, and therefore have no known immunity to this virus and that's another reason why this virus has spread so fast to so many different countries uh, causing a pandemic. There are many unknowns still that we are, as I said, trying to figure out as we go along and as more data is being gathered. So um, we will uh, kind of uh, later focus on what are the classic symptoms of COVID-19, but more and more data is coming to show that the full extent and spectrum of the disease is actually might be very different from what we are being told as far as cough and shortness of breath are concerned because more evidence is emerging that many infected people could be very mildly ill or could even be asymptomatic. So the spectrum of disease varies from mild, obviously, to death. And we'll talk about details later about this. Another uh, thing we're learning is the host immune response. So like any infectious agent, whenever we are uh, exposed to that agent, our body produces certain innate and adaptive immune responses. And the way sometimes we respond to a noxious agent, such as a virus, depends on how uh, the clinical manifestations of the disease will be. And seems like here, again, there is more evidence that tells us that the host immune response, the severity of the host immune response, what you have heard about as the cytokine storm in some patients is contributing to the severity of the disease. And we obviously haven't figured out why some patients are developing the cytokine storm and, this, uh, and the massive immune response and some others are not and are only having mild disease. The other thing that comes up a lot is the mode of transmission. We do know that this is a highly efficacious virus. It is uh, a, um, the reproductive number, which is the, which is the number that means if one person is infected with SARS-CoV-2, how many other people does that person infect? And that number is 2 to 2.5. So meaning from one person, we can have two to three other people infected. And that's a pretty high number. And experts say that we're not going to be able to reduce or stop this pandemic until that number becomes less than one. So why is this virus so contagious then, or why is it spreading so fast? We said partly because we don't have immunity to it, but partly uh, we still have to figure out exactly how much each of these methods of transmission is contributing to transmission. In general, um, respiratory viruses are mostly transmitted via large droplets where the virus is suspended in those droplets and, and infects another person. But we, as I'm going to show you in the next few slides, may have evidence that there is also contact involved um, in the transmission of this virus. A few uh, studies have shown that it is found in uh, feces. However, that seems to be a very, very uh, uh, low level of transmission at this point. We don't know if there is mother to child transmission during pregnancy. And the big question is, which the WHO continues to tell us, it's uh, probably not airborne, but that hasn't been fully um, uh, elucidated yet. And then, of course, why we are all worried about this disease is the true mortality rate of this disease. 
You guys all know that the influenza uh, is a pretty severe illness, uh, which and for which we have a vaccine every year, which hopefully everybody is getting. And the mortality rate of that virus is about 0.1%. And as you can imagine, even the 0.1% is a high enough number. And that's why we do our best to vaccinate everyone and to start medication early if we know someone is sick with the flu. For this one, the mortality rate that's reported in different countries is different. So it's been reported to be as low as 0.7% in South Korea versus 3.7% in China. In the US so far, it seems to be 2%. But again, these are, this is, these are not accurate mortality rates because as we will talk about later, we do not know, we do not know the actual denominator, the actual number of infected people people, especially as I said, there's a lot of people who have no symptoms who are infected or mild symptoms who are infected. We just haven't counted those people. So the mortality rate final one will be determined once we know how many people are truly infected. But it is very clear from all the data that in the elderly and in other high risk groups, which we're going to talk about, there does definitely seem to be a significant mortality rate approaching a 5%, if not higher in certain uh, groups of people. So uh, what is the CDC? If you went to the CDC every day in, in the months of February and March, you would see that this section was changing every single day, really. But, uh, and as you know, the situation is rapidly evolving in different, uh, at different rates in different cities in the USA. In, uh, in, in the New York and New Jersey and Connecticut area, for example, we are in the acceleration phase. That means we are seeing doubling of our numbers every two to three days and that's followed by a death number which usually lags behind the new infection number. So this is the time right now uh, for us to do every single uh, possible measure to, to, to flatten the curve which we're going to talk about in a few slides. But uh, different uh, cities are going through their own rates and basically we do know that uh, anyone is considered at elevated risk of exposure if they satisfy any of these uh, criteria that I am putting on the slides here. One is people in locations, both in the US, for example, of course, New York, and internationally, where ongoing sustained community spread of COVID-19 is occurring. That's exactly putting you at risk already. Number two is most of us on this call who are healthcare workers caring for patients with COVID-19. And number three, which is how the community is uh, getting exposed to it, is really defined as close contacts of people with COVID-19. And the way close contact has been defined and continues to hold true is anyone who is within six feet or two meters of a person with COVID-19 for a prolonged period of time. So prolonged period of time means not just the passing, uh, you know, passing by each other on the street or paying the cashier at the grocery store and leaving. Those are supposed to be very brief encounters. But anything that's more than 10 to 15 minutes is considered prolonged. So clearly people who are caring for, living with, visiting or sharing a healthcare waiting area or room with a COVID-19 case, um, including, by the way, I should have added, um, now it's not relevant because all schools are closed, but within a classroom, uh, that's also considered close contact. Or close contact is defined as having direct contact with infectious secretions of a, of a person with COVID-19, which means obviously if somebody coughed on you who has COVID-19 or there is contact with their sputum or even blood or any other really uh, excreta or secretions coming from that person. So based on these, uh, these exposures, this is why we have uh, continued recommendations and updated recommendations, uh, again, to try to reduce, uh, reduce um, the peaks and the acceleration phase and flatten the curve.
This was a, a paper published in the New England Journal of Medicine. This was an experimental uh, conditions. This was not in real life, but um, they, the, red, the red is the SARS-CoV-2 and they compared it to SARS-CoV-1 uh, in order to see how long does this virus really stay, again, in experimental conditions on certain surfaces. As you can see, uh, for the aerosol, which is the first one, uh, by two hours already, you do have a log decrease in the amount of particles in the air. So that kind of may translate to the fact that aerosolization probably is not a very efficient way of transmission of this virus. For example, for measles, uh, if you were to look at the curve, it looks like hours and hours, 10 hours later, the, the virus is still suspended in the air. For this one, there seems to be maybe only an hour or two of suspension in aerosolization. When we come to other materials such as copper, cardboard, stainless steel, and plastic, as you can see, especially for plastic, for example, they were able to detect the virus up to 40 hours later on those materials. Also stainless steel, you can see that that red curve is um, the, the x-axis is the hours um, and the y-axis is the uh, log decrease in the amount of virus. And you can see that on those materials, steel and plastic, there se it seems that the virus was able to survive under those experimental conditions. So from these data is why we are also saying could contact uh, with someone who has COVID-19 and touched a surface such as steel or plastic, and then you go ahead and touch that same surface, could you also uh, get the infection? So uh, these are, I'm sure you've seen, and uh, probably ad nauseum, uh, it's just worth again mentioning why, uh, based on the fact that close contact and these materials uh, is how the disease is transmitted. So we want to again oh, rem remind yourselves, you could be now joining us from a rural area where you might have only one case versus me who I'm telling you I have hundreds of cases already in the hospital. It doesn't matter. These personal prevention measures have to be happening every single day. Our lifestyle have to has to change to reflect these measures in order uh, for us to participate in in reducing this infection. Uh, so washing your hands often with soap and water, uh, avoid touching your eyes, nose and mouth. That's, uh, that cannot be overemphasized because the virus really lives in the nasal uh, mucosa. Um, so there is many beautiful studies showing that that's where we find the virus the most and also uh, deep in the lungs. So we wanna make sure that we are avoiding to touch those, uh, the, those areas at all times. Uh, obviously, avoid close contact with anyone at this point, not just those who are sick. Uh, cleaning and disinfecting frequently touched objects, which I'll touch on in the next few slides. And then again, um, I like the term physical distancing rather than social distancing, because we can still be social online. We can use Zoom or other technologies and phone calls to connect with each other. It's really the physical distance. We don't want to be in close contact with anyone who may have COVID-19. So obviously, if you are in a crowded area, enclosed area, poorly ventilated area, that automatically is going to make you uh, at risk of catching the disease if someone else in that same room has the, has the virus. Obviously, by now, everybody knows we're no longer shaking hands. We're no longer kissing hello. We're no longer kissing goodbye. I know that some states, uh, they're saying there is religious exemptions. I hope none of us here are living in those states. We know that our churches have been very well um, in being compliant with our recommendations and we haven't been holding any uh, church services. Obviously, no essential travel, um, uh, no non-essential travel, and please do not travel at all unless you really, really have to. So uh, now, based on the uh, uh, data that came about in the last week or so, showing, and I'll show you this in the pediatric data in the next few slides, showing that some people truly have the virus and, develop, and have no symptoms, the CDC, as of last week, revised their recommendations after saying for many, many weeks that we don't need to wear um, masks in public. Now they are saying that they do recommend recommend wearing a cloth face coverings in public settings where you cannot 
control the distance between you and somebody else. So let's say you go to the grocery store and obviously you cannot push the person who's behind you. You can as much as possible avoid them, but in places where again, you cannot control how many other people there are, especially in areas of significant community-based transmission, the CDC now recommends wearing these uh, cloth face uh, coverings. Um, uh, so as you can see in the picture and as you can see in the slide, they have uh, recommendations of how to wear a cloth face covering, make sure it's fitting snugly uh, and but comfortably, that it's secured with ties, that includes multiple layers of fabric, allows for breathing, and is able to be laundered or machine dried without damage or change to the shape. So it is important to, again, remember that you can make this from home or from, the, from a t-shirt cloth or any cloth you have, even bandanas and scarves should work. This is based on no, by the way, scientific evidence. This is just to, um, to make sure that someone is just not breathing in your face and, and passing on the virus during that uh, encounter with them. Um, make sure again, uh, this is uh, hopefully everybody will listen and not go and hoard the surgical masks or the N95 respirators, which remain in, in major shortage in pretty much every state. So those are critical supplies that must uh, continue to be reserved for healthcare workers and other medical first responders. And then we don't want to use uh, it on young children under age two or anyone who cannot remove it on their own. Now, if you do have a surgical face mask, let's be honest, some of us may have it. What we are doing in the hospitals and what we, I recommend you guys to do as well is that uh, you can reuse those, uh, those masks. Ideally, they are disposable, but again, in a shortage, we can reuse them. And uh, the best way is to remove it from the back of the ears without touching the front, put it in a paper bag uh, when you come home, and then let's say in three days, four days, you urgently, urgently need to go to the grocery store to buy something, you can reuse that mask. Uh, this should not take the place of, so, of physical distancing, guys, especially again, we are in the acceleration phase in most parts of the country, so we really want people to stay home. That really should be the main, 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 main message. Stay home, stay home, stay home, until we descend uh, the mountain. But if you really have to go out, then this is maybe an extra measure, if used correctly, that may protect you. Uh, I already saw reporters on TV over the weekend where they had the masks under their chin, you know, because they needed to speak, I guess, and then put it back on. That's really the wrong way of using, uh, using uh, the mask because basically your secretions from your mouth while you're speaking will drop on that mask and then you put it back on and it really, the, the virus now is on the outside of the mask. So we don't want a false sense of security or false way of using these masks. Okay, uh, the cleaning and disinfecting, as I showed you in the experimental uh, data, there is some evidence that the, the virus may survive on, on such surfaces. So right now we are recommending that any packaging that you receive or bring in from outside that may have been touched by someone who has the virus should be cleaned and disinfected. So uh, people ask me about food, how to wash the vegetables, or can we order a pizza and eat it? Yes, there is so far zero evidence, as I said, that this is transmitted through food. So once you get your groceries in, um, you please wash your hands very well, and then you can just wash your vegetables like you, you would usually do, and process your foods, your meats, like you would usually do. What needs to be cleaned up is really the, the, um, the packaging that it comes in. So let's say if it comes in cardboard packages, make sure that you wash your hands first, and then take any cleaning product and wipe those packages down. Or if you order the pizza, just make sure you first, before you open that box, try to clean it up. So that's really the message that we want to give. And then, of course, uh, the steel. What, what is steel that we touch all the time? So doorknobs, elevator uh, buttons, all those things you have to be aware of not using your fingers, maybe just your elbows. Uh, don't touch, don't open doors by your hand, try to you open them and close them and push buttons with your elbows. 
And then at home, uh, it's very important to also clean commonly touched surfaces such as light switches, tabletops, doorknobs, cell phones, remote controls, tablets, keyboards, uh, toilets, and sinks. And this becomes especially important if there is somebody who is sick in the household with COVID-19 or suspected COVID-19. So obviously every single surface that that person is touching, first of all, they should avoid touching them. But if they do, they need to be cleaned and cleaned and cleaned. So we need to be a little bit more OCD about, uh, about cleaning in general. And common household cleaning products work, guys. So you can uh, dilute your household bleach or you can buy Clorox wipes. Please don't mix the household bleach with ammonia, vinegar, rubbing alcohol, or any other cleanser. Make sure you are using non-expired products and make sure you label them appropriately once you make these diluted products so that the children in the household don't accidentally uh, ingest them. Okay, so all this, again, the masks, the staying home, the avoiding the travel, the avoiding the close contact, the avoiding doing anything really, is, as you guys know, to flatten this curve. As you can see on the left, if we don't do any of these personal measures and community mitigation measures of closing the schools and staying home, then we will have a very sharp peak. And uh, as you can see in the dotted line, the healthcare system capacity uh, will be surpassed, will be overwhelmed. I can tell you from our experience in New York, despite our extreme efforts from donations and our governor and trying their best, we, uh, you know, have hospitals that are really, really struggling and are not able to take care of all the patients. And we have to uh, have uh, create extra beds and extra personnel because a lot of people also are falling sick. So, and this is New York is supposed to be, you know, a city where, where things are available. And so I urge everyone uh, who's listening to really uh, understand this curve, explain it to those who, who are not you know, understanding why we're doing all this is really to first redu reduce the, the peak burden on the hospitals and the infrastructure so that we can actually take care of, of those who are going to come in uh, sick. Okay. So uh, Dr. Melikian will probably go more into detail about this, but just a brief overview of the classic signs and symptoms. First of all, the incubation period. Sorry, I took this uh, as a picture from somebody else. But uh, as you can see that the, the incubation period is usually between uh, two and 21 days really, but the bulk of the people are developing symptoms be, uh, at, by day five, meaning you are exposed to someone with COVID-19 and about five days later is when you are do developing your own symptoms of COVID-19. But the range is between two to 14 days. Uh, the virus can be detected when patients are pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic, as we said, but the peak of the virus is detected really during symptoms, and that has been shown in very nice studies. Uh, in early studies from China, it was evident that there was significant household transmission, and that's not surprising if everybody's cooped up and especially living several people together when, and when there's no room to separate the sick from the non-sick. And of course, the most commonly uh, described uh, symptom is cough. Uh, fever uh, may or may not be there. Sometimes it's, it's happening after presentation, after a day or two. Uh, shortness of breath, difficulty breathing, of course. And then some people have had some GI symptoms and abdominal pain in adults. The main laboratory criteria are lymphopenia and transaminitis. And again, Dr. Melikian will go into details on this. And of course, the complications that we are worried about are the severe pneumonia, ICU stay, ARDS, and death. Um, I didn't put this in the slide, but I should emphasize that 80% of us who are going to get this virus are going to have mild symptoms and will not need hospitalization and intensive care unit and will not die. But the 20% who are having uh, to get into the hospitals and a few of them die are really this uh, defined uh, high risk group of people who are the elderly above 65 years old. Um, 
uh, or people with chronic medical conditions such as cardiovascular disease, poorly controlled diabetes, chronic lung disease, the immunocompromised or the pregnant population. Now, uh, this was all data coming from Asia. We do know that in the US, now that we are seeing cases for the past month, we have had many healthy adults as well who have come in in their 20s, 30s, and 40s and have been hospitalized. But again, those are a minority compared to the, to the risk group that I just defined. Okay, so in the next few slides, I just want to talk about the pediatric COVID-19. So far, we have three studies from China, three studies, really main studies that with a significant number of patients, and they all are from China. And as, as, I, as you can see, I highlighted how many of the kids were asymptomatic. So in one, 13% of virologically confirmed cases had no symptoms. So this is a rate that almost certainly understates the true rate of asymptomatic infection, because many asymptomatic symptomatic children here, especially in the US, are unlikely to be tested. Among the symptomatic children, 5% only had dyspnea or hypoxemia, and 0.6% progressed to ARDS or multi-organ system dysfunction. So, um, and this is a consistent finding in all the studies where children seem to be doing much, much better in this, uh, with this disease, and that's why they're not in the high-risk group. So they are developing milder symptoms, and they are also um, just uh, infected less. Uh, but part of it is because they have no symptoms and they are not being captured. Another study looked at 36 children, which accounted for 5% of their whole total patients with COVID-19 in that paper. And again, 28% uh, uh, of those um, 36 children were asymptomatic, and they were really identified because either an adult family member had the infection or they had been exposed uh, in an epidemic area. And in this group of 36, again, no, no children developed severe illness or died. And their most common reported clinical finding was pneumonia, 53%. But as you can see, the other half doesn't have pneumonia. So we don't have the same respiratory, lower respiratory tract disease as as um, adults are seeing. Uh, fever, dry cough, or both were the next most frequent symptoms in that study. And the last one is actually the largest one, which is uh, from Wuhan, China. They had, again, 1,391 children who were assessed and tested, and 12.3% uh, of those children really only had SARS-CoV-2, again, a small percentage. The median age was 6.7 years. Uh, and again, as you can see, fever was present only in 40% of those children. So you have a majority of kids who are not even going to present with fever. Uh, other common symptoms in this study were cough and pharyngeal edema, and again, a very few patients needed hospitalization. Um, in the US, uh, there is a website where we can track uh, all the uh, kids who have needed a pediatric ICU admission, and only 160 sites are reporting to that website, so it doesn't, it's not a complete number. But as you can see, there have been only 106 pediatric ICU admissions in the whole country over the whole last month. So that is really, uh, uh, you know, compared to adults, obviously a very, very uh, reassuring thing. Uh, 39 of the 106 were in New York. And uh, however, these kids, just like anybody else in the ICU, they needed conventional mechanical ventilation, 75% of them, and one, uh, one died. And 35% of these children, by the way, had no underlying medical condition. So like anything in life, it's a bell-shaped curve. You're always going to have the outliers, the healthy adults, healthy kids who will succumb to this disease. And as I said, we don't know why some do and some don't. So our data in our hospital, uh, I have this table that is in press, so please don't share it. This is, um, uh, we had 20 uh, women, uh, pregnant women, who delivered babies in the last two weeks. Uh, the women who were COVID-19 positive. And out of those, half of them, uh, their kids ended up in the NICU. So we compared why, uh, what was the difference of the women be, uh, whose babies went to the NICU and whose babies went to the regular nursery. And we have uh, noted that five out of these 
um, nine uh, kids who ended up in the NICU, their moms had been having symptoms for more than seven days. And that, as Dr. Manikian will tell you, uh, the people who are deteriorating and ending up in the hospital are actually deteriorating probably after day six, seven, or eight of illness. So these women had already been sick for a week. And then during their second week of illness, they went into major respiratory distress. Three out of these nine women ended up in the ICU themselves, and they had preterm labor, 31 weeks, 32 weeks, 35 weeks. And obviously, prematurity could be one reason why the babies ended up in the NICU, but also the, the babies themselves went into respiratory distress and had to be uh, on CPAP or intubated and needed some NICU care. I must point out that none of these infants themselves had uh, COVID-19 when we tested them at between 24 to 36 hours of life. And that is consistent with the literature where some of the data from China uh, has done, has looked at amniotic fluid, at placenta, um, uh, and, and, and uh, um, viral detection in the neonates born to COVID-19 moms, and so far hasn't been able to uh, show that there is any evidence of vertical transmission of mom to baby in utero. But um, after we discharged some of these babies, I can tell you that we had three babies admitted during their first month of life after they went home from the nursery with COVID-19. They presented with fever and they had to have a full sepsis workup. And obviously those babies acquired their infection at home because of their positive mom or so in some cases positive dad or positive uh, family member in the household with COVID-19. So obviously neonates as young as 10, 11 days are getting the infection. So far, none of them needed, you know, intensive care unit. But that again is very important to remind all of our families we're discharging home with newborns to make sure that the person who's infected does not touch the baby as much as possible. Somebody else who has no symptoms should be taking care of the baby. Even that person should be wearing a mask gloves, uh, everything they can during the bathing, the feeding, and, and touching the baby. We are allowing breast milk because there's no, again, evidence from the very few data that, uh, that the virus uh, is in breast milk. But we're saying to these moms who are COVID positive, please pump your breast milk, put it in a bottle, and again, the other designated family member can, can feed the baby to prevent infections in the baby. Uh, uh, we have had a variety of presentations. Otherwise, we have had about 20 kids so far admitted to the hospital. And again, in our hospital, we're only testing kids who are hospitalized. So people who are just presenting to the clinics or the emergency rooms are not being tested right now. So um, in the admitted patients, there was a variety of symptomatology, anywhere from bronchiolitis to one kid with fever and headache. And two kids recently who came in with cellulitis, had nothing to do with COVID-19, but because they had a family member who was a positive for COVID-19, so again, close contact, we tested them, and sure enough, they were COVID-19 positive. So they didn't have any respiratory symptoms, and they wouldn't have been captured if they were not being admitted for something else. So in summary, uh, there are no case definitions and management strategies for children yet that are coherent in all of the U.S. Because as I just showed you, there is very limited number of pediatric patients published. And we are publishing ours soon and just the total number is low. But we definitely do believe based on what I showed you that children still have the virus. They are not exempt from this infection and they are actually playing a major role in community-based viral transmission transmission especially that uh, in Seattle children's, they have uh, testing available much more readily than all of us. And they actually found tons and tons of virus in the, na na um, in the noses of these children. So they can, you know, just sneeze or, or them singing or just them breathing could really transmit the virus to the vulnerable population. I don't know if I should keep going because I feel like I am already 30 minutes. 
quickly, I wanted to mention that there is testing available, as all of you know, and the, the FDA already has 23 PCR-based assays for SARS-CoV-2 that have been approved uh, under their emergency utilization authorization process, and there are more coming into the market. Um, there is only one that's point of care, which is the Abbott testing. Whoever already has it, you guys are lucky. We're hoping to get it by the end of this week so that we can get a turnaround time of you know two hours instead of 24 hours which is what we have right now but uh, again just so you know there is also shortages of nasal swabs and viral transport media so you fix one thing and you are faced with something else Similarly, serology assays are going to be super important in the future for uh, to see again how many people are infected without symptoms. I wanted to again tell you that the FDA has a very nice list of all the tests that are in the pipeline, but there's only one assay so far that is FDA approved. The other 51 are waiting to be approved. So we want you to know that there are scammers out there trying to sell antibody tests. So make sure that please you read very carefully, make sure that if there are disclaimers saying they don't know the antibody test characteristics or the test has not been reviewed by the FDA or, uh, or the other stuff I wrote here, please make sure that you stay away from those vendors and everybody is being scammed. Um, the last is home COVID-19 testing. At this time, as of Monday, I'm not sure if there's an update uh, as of tonight, but as of uh, today, the FDA has not authorized any test that's available for purchase for testing at home, but they do know how important this is and they're working on approving some of these tests in the future. So the current strategy is really because we are prioritizing testing in this country for the moderately to severely sick, which are the hospitalized, and we don't have enough tests to do outpatient testing. We are really uh, only relying, therefore, on the mitigation processes to, to stop the spread of the virus because there's no other way to, to do it. And of course, we want to educate the mildly sick, uh, uh, telling them to stay in, in the house and isolate themselves, especially from the elderly and the vulnerable, including um, children who are just sneezing or, uh, you know, mildly ill, again, they need to isolate themselves as much as possible from the elderly so that we don't uh, overwhelm uh, the healthcare system. And now I'm going to like to introduce the next speaker. Our next speaker is Dr. George Melikian. Dr. Melikian is a board certified physician who specializes in infectious diseases and internal medicine. He is the, uh, he's also a professional uh, statistician. He received his master's degree in infectious uh, diseases, epidemiology, and biostatistics from Yale University, and his medical degree from the New York Medical College. He completed his uh, medicine residency at the University of Rochester at the Strong Memorial Hospital, and did his infectious diseases fellowship subspecialty at Stanford University School of Medicine. Since that time, he has practiced medicine in several roles. He is, uh, he is um, uh, serving as an attending physician and the regional medical director of the AIDS Healthcare Foundation. He has successfully managed over 40 specialty clinics in HIV and AIDS healthcare. He's also the principal investigator on numerous cr uh, clinical research studies, and he is currently the director of the infectious diseases at Facey Medical Group in uh, Southern California. With that, uh, I'd like to turn the, I guess, the, the video screens to Dr. Thank you very much. Uh, let me just share the screen, my talk here. So just to start off, this is one of the uh, kind of uh, fringe benefits of uh, social isolation. This is all, all uh, death by all causes year after year. And the curve here is for 2020. You can see where uh, deaths have significantly declined, probably because we're all um, isolating ourselves. Uh, so the coronaviridae are RNA viruses, they're helical and envelopes. They fall into this category here, a close relative of retroviruses, which many of you know, know of, probably the most famous one being HIV. Um, these are the six prior to 
this pandemic, these were the known six human coronaviruses. Uh, on the top two, we see the 229 and NL63. These are both very, and I'll, and I'll say why I'm going into a little bit of detail about the NL63. Both of these um, are very benign viruses with humans. They're, they just cause very common colds, nothing serious. Uh, down below, the two more recent serious uh, pandemics was the SARS-2003 and the MERS-2012. All the coronaviruses come from animal reservoirs and, and in some cases intermediates. Uh, for example, with MERS, the, it was camels and bats. The SARS-CoV-1, the 2003, which is almost identical to this one, also was bats and palm civets. These civets are uh, these um, mammalian, I don't know what they look like, they look sort of like really large squirrels um, that uh, are at these wet markets. And these have been re recently, the genetics of the coronavirus has been sequenced all the way back and studied phylogenetically. Uh, there was this nature paper about a week and a half ago that tracked it down fairly accurately down to uh, the, the late, late part of last year and between these two organisms. It's likely that it jumped from the bats to, to the mammal, to the palm civet, I'm, I'm sorry, up here, and then jumped to humans, excuse me. The other thing I wanted to point out that is I think an interesting um, pattern here, this is, this is something that uh, in the future, I think there some evidence, some testing will sort out. But the receptor that the coronavirus attaches to is the current one is the ACE2. Um, and this is the same um, ACE2 receptor that the palm, the NL63, uh, virus attaches to that was discovered in 2004. The NL63 again is a very, very benign virus. It, it's almost completely asymptomatic or can cause some mild cold. Why do I say that? Well, this is uh, from a study several years ago and there's multiple studies that show pretty much the same pattern. This is looking at uh, serology and antibodies among uh, different age, age groups to the different coronaviruses. And notice the Netherlands 63 strain, the, the really benign one, 70% in ages zero to nine, and it's steadily, it's this green bar, and it steadily drops off until those 60 years and older um, have no, no antibodies towards it. It's interesting because this is an exact opposite uh, pattern that we see um, with COVID 2019, those with 60 years and older are the ones who are having the most serious disease and what uh, uh, Dr. Sonia was talking about in, in the previous presentation, children um, have fairly benign uh, outcomes. So it may be that there's some cross, cross protection here uh, with folks who had serology, had antibodies to NL63 and, and again, it's the same receptor and it's the same um, host intermediate. So moving on, these are just a collect collection of uh, journal article headlines that I, that I put together that I collected just to show you that this was not, nothing new. These are all from 2003 and, and forward, uh, talking about Chinese wet markets, zoonotic, uh, origins, wet markets, source of respiratory infections, bats, civets, same thing. So uh, like they say, history has a, has a way of uh, repeating itself. We don't learn from it. We talk about the incubation period uh, for coronavirus. You'd, you'll see um, the, you know, the recommendations to isolate for 14 days. Incubation period again, is the time between when somebody is exposed to the virus to when they start having symptoms. On average, that incubation period, uh, the median time, I should say, actually, is about five days. And this really came from this original paper that looked at 181 uh, patients from China and really followed them closely uh, from uh, several different provinces. And, it, and they 
uh, followed them closely and monitored their symptoms and their exposure. And the 14 day uh, period, basically, when, when we talk about 14 days, that would cover 97.5% of, uh, it, if you're not symptomatic at 14 days, uh, you have a 97.5% chance of not having been um, infected. So that's where this data comes from. Um, again, the early data, this is from a JAMA paper, the early data showed that most folks, almost everybody with fever, fatigue, and dry cough. And this is again, this infection, if you have to classify it, it would be one of fever and a dry cough, I would say. And I'll, in a few slides, I'll go um, discuss some of the newer data, which is showing more asymptomatic cases. And this is again, the same sort of summary uh, to keep in mind for those in the community, especially in primary care, if you're seeing runny nose, um, that's not part of COVID-19. It's really a rare presentation. If you're seeing pleural effusions, that's not a common presentation. Of course, somebody can have a superimposed pneumonia, but that's not a common presentation as runny nose. It's really a dry cough and fever. More recently, uh, data is starting to show that more and more folks who are infected are indeed asymptomatic. Um, in Iceland, testing showing 50% of cases um, that were just tested. This is what the benefit of random testing is versus focused testing, which is what we have right now. We're just testing patients who are symptomatic. The random testing gives, gives a better idea of what the prevalence is in the community. Anyway, in Iceland, showing 50% have no symptoms, be it tested positive. Um, and same thing um, here in a recent paper from China. This was in BMJ. I'll come back to this in, in a second. Uh, the other uh, point I wanted to highlight, maybe some of you have heard that the death rate or the risk of mortality, this is from uh, about 44,000 patients in China. This is WHO data. The risk of death is greatest in those who have pre-existing cardiovascular disease, uh, even more so than cancer and chronic respiratory disease. Uh, perhaps this is associated with the, the ACE2 receptor where this virus binds. As you know, so that's the same ACE2 angiotensin con converting enzyme receptor um, that is involved with the renin angiotensin system. Um, this is a, a, a graph, a, a figure from the Siddiqui paper. This is a good summary of what the course of illness is with uh, COVID-19. The, the infection has two kind of, uh, two periods to it. The first uh, approximately on median of nine days, it's this viral replication phase. And this is the period where people are having fevers, having uh, perhaps cough and myalgia, but generally may be fairly stable from a respiratory uh, standpoint. Um, once this period is over, then there's this host inflammatory response period that kicks in where there's what we call that cytokine storm, IL-6. And if patients do uh, deteriorate clinically, this is the period where that starts around day nine. Um, and from this, this point forward, this is where ARDS, cardiac failure, all the, all the uh, poor outcomes that um, happen in this period. Of course, again, that's not everybody. That's still 20%, 15 to 20% are needing hospitalization and the mortality rate is around 1%. But when it happens, it's this late. This is important because when we talk about treatment, it's really if somebody's it's important to catch people in this, in the stage one, in the early infection, and start them on medications if we can, if they're in the high risk group, if they have underlying cardiac disease, if they're elderly. Once the, once the patient goes into this second phase, into this inflammatory response phase, uh, the probability of mortality is very high. Once you go into ARDS, um, the chance of survival is about 30% and some studies even less. So uh, this brings us to, 
to testing. Um, we don't have a lot of data on testing just yet about how accurate testing is. This is probably the, the best paper that, uh, that there is. This was in JAMA. This took, whoops, this took a group of patients um, and tested them using uh, multiple uh, modalities, including looking at bronchial alveolar lavage, uh, sputum, nasal swab, pharyngeal swabs, urine. Um, these were all positive patients. So you could see the, the, the tests that we're using now are pharyngeal or nasal, nasal swabs. And the sensitivity here is 63%, 32%. 72% from sputum. These aren't, you know, phenomenal numbers. The highest, of course, is uh, from bronchial alveolar fluid, but uh, that's very invasive and uh, we don't recommend that uh, even in somebody who's intubated if you could avoid it because of the, of the risk of infection. But anyway, it just, this is one of the challenges that we have ahead. So, and this is what we're doing right now in the hospital is we have to be very careful when and when we have patients who are who are in there who may test negative, sometimes test negative the first time, and we, if they clinically look like they've got COVID, uh, we still keep them isolated, we still treat them, and may retest them. And we've had several cases where the second test did turn turn up positive. Sometimes we have two tests that turns up positive, but clinically it really looks like COVID, and we and we continue. Of course, you have to be diligent to rule other things out. This is a busy slide, and I don't expect to, uh, you know, for everybody to be able to read all the fine print here. But these are all the diagnostic tests uh, currently that are approved, except for the ones in the bottom. This is by FDA emergency use. Um, the CE mark is for for Europe, and you can see these are almost, you know, essentially all PCR-based tests with turnaround times uh, under 24 hours. Most of them are actually very quick in the, in the range of three to four hours. So these should be rolling out. So back to the mortality issue and uh, I'm sorry, back to the presentation issue and what patients look like. As far as symptoms, one of the best sources of data has come from this Diamond Princess cruise ship uh, where you know the, the entire cruise ship was isolated. Everybody was tested and we, when we had a better idea of what this infection looks like in a closed population. Let me just skip one slide ahead and I'll come back to this. So looking at, this is looking at everybody that was tested um, on that ship. I want to point out to you the um, ratio of asymptomatic to symptomatic cases. And you can see um, in the, well, the samples are small in the, in the, in the younger age, but he, as you go up here, we're looking at 40s and 50% rate of asymptomatic to symptomatic cases, which as you notice, is starting to look very similar to the Iceland data. And it's likely this is what the natural um, history of this infection looks like in the community. Why is this important? Well, this is also important because from the uh, Princess Diamond Princess Cruise Line data, we, I think we can get a fairly solid estimate of what mortality is in which of with this infection. In this case, um, what the data does show is it's somewhere between 1 point, uh, 0 0.9 to 1.9. This is the difference between infection fatality rate and case fatality rate. And uh, the infection fatality rate is those who don't fit exactly the case definition but maybe asymptomatic. This is important because if we can nail down the mortality rate uh, using this data, then we can back estimate when we look, when we, when we look at a population, like we look at what's going on in Los Angeles, we see how many tested positive and we see how many people have died. If that number is elevated, for example, if we're seeing a mortality rate, let's just say 10%, what we can do is back estimate what the actual prevalence of the population is. It's not likely that the infection is, has a 10% mortality rate. It's likely that we're not, we're not testing everybody. We're missing a bunch of cases. And we basically, we could divide that 10% by the 1% and get the ratio for 
uh, how many cases are out there that haven't been covered. And this is what they did in this very smart study um, globally. And uh, this is the percentage of cases reported. And it's estimated in the United States, this is as of about uh, a week ago, uh, looking at the more, based on the mortality rates that we have right now, we're, we're capturing 15% of cases reported. So there's many more cases out there that, that aren't covered. But I think we can be fairly certain that the mortality rate is about 1%. Of course, by age, let me just go back here, certainly it goes up at uh, 70 plus age, we're going to 14 to 18%. There's truncated versus non-truncated. What this means, for those of you, if you have an epidemiologic interest, they, this is, if there's a correction, the non-truncated is the raw data. Truncated means there was right censoring done to estimate uh, patients who were captured but maybe hadn't died yet at the time of capturing. Uh, and you can add those and say, okay, well, however many percent more, uh, in the infected will also die, and that was added to it. So it, uh, it brings, uh, brings up the mortality. Uh, I'm going to talk about the, about the clinical course. We, by the way, have uh, several COVID patients at, at two hospitals where I work about a week, week and a half ago. I think we had maybe three or four. Between both hospitals, we're up to probably around, around 30 patients with COVID. So it's really picked up. These are some important, this was uh, from a Lancet paper. And I think in practice too, from what I've seen and what my colleagues have seen, it really does echo what we're seeing. These are the difference in um, various lab values, lab markers, inflammatory markers between survivors, whoops, survivors and non-survivors. Um, we see a, a, a steep um, uh, uh, increase in D-dimer, um, a drop in lymphocyte count, lymphopenia. It's likely that patients are undergoing um, a lot of uh, microthrombi, microthrombotic events, whoops, IL-6 levels significantly elevated between non-survivors versus survivors down below. Serum ferritin, an inflammatory marker, again, showing completely um, different courses here. Same thing with uh, troponin levels, and these really peaking in, uh, at the end, probably mostly associated with death. Uh, lactate dehydrogenase levels, again, significantly different and elevated in non-survivors. Um, I could tell you this, uh, before I say what I was going to say, this is a general graph of symptoms between survivors up top and non-survivors. Uh, over here you see fever, cough, ICU admission. Um, generally, these two graphs are the same with the, only, with the only difference really being this ICU admission band. And even that isn't significantly different. Uh, but I could tell you in practice really what it is, the folks who are coming in who aren't doing well are the ones who came in uh, with symptoms over a week, seven days, eight days, nine days, and then they came in and they're well into that cytokine storm. And when, the, when that happens, when you're in that range, it's you're fighting a different, uh, a different beast. It's not as much really about getting the virus under control, but uh, fighting the body's inflammatory response to it. I wanted to show you this. This, uh, this is from the same paper and it, and it is showing um, some of the associated um, organ uh, complications with uh, between survivors and non-survivors in total. And what I wanted to show is really the a focus here on kidney injury that we see, a lot of uh, renal failure, cardiac injury, coagulopathy, of course, uh, septic shock, and heart failure. Uh, this is important to keep in mind, also secondary infection as well. This is important to keep in mind uh, as far as treatment goes. I'll, I'll go through that in a minute uh, shortly. Um, as far as imaging, what, what can, can, have we learned so far? Um, we, you can use a lung, well, a CT of the chest, which does have some very specific findings that many are using as a, as a surrogate for diagnosis. 
I'll show you some of those imaging findings here in a second. You can also use uh, what we suggest if you have somebody who is um, uh, proficient enough to do a bedside ultrasound, it may be a better choice. Uh, the reason being that the, the CAT scan, at least at our hospitals, it takes about an hour to sterilize the CAT scan room between each case uh, for somebody with COVID or probable COVID. Um, and there's a higher risk of infection. As far as using steroids, the, the overall consensus so far has been not to use steroids um, in, in the, during the cytokine uh, storm uh, period of the infection. There are a number of reasons for that. Again, hard data is not out yet. There, is, there was one study that showed benefit. There was two other studies that didn't show benefit. But generally what we know from other coronaviruses as well is the main reasons to, to consider avoiding steroids is knowing it's known to, to delay clearance of virus uh, or increase shedding basically from the blood and respiratory tract. Uh, it's also in associate, was associated with increased mortality with influenza uh, from a meta-analysis. So it was a very large meta-analysis of 6,500 patients. Um, steroids also uh, is a risk factor in the sense that it, it promotes fluid retention. And we're dealing with ARDS, which is very fluid sensitive. These are just general recommendations. Um, I'll skip this slide. We've already covered about the, these are just general trends in uh, incubation time and time to death, time to hospitalization, but they reflect essentially what we already talked about. Uh, as far as treatments, um, th you know, this is a large slide showing all sorts of medications that, are, that have either failed or, or, or are in clinical trials. Kaletra, Lopinavir, there was a paper in uh, the New England Journal about two weeks ago that showed it did not show any benefit. Uh, we are using uh, hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin for a four day course in our patients. I could tell you empirically, I think it's had an effect, uh, not in cases where it's delivered late in the, in the cytokine storm stage, but for the patients that I've had it really all except one, um, all except two, Everybody who got it early um, did okay. Didn't end up getting going on the uh, on the ventilator. How does hydroxychloroquine work? Um, this was a good uh, paper that really reviewed the mechanism in cell discovery. It, it's really thought to inhibit um, cell entry by by changing the glycosylation. Uh, of the ACE2 receptor and the spike protein on the virus itself. By the way, it's called a coronavirus because it, ha it looks like a corona radiata, a crown really, and it has this, the virus has these spike proteins all around it. And that's what it uses to attach to the, to the ACE receptor. Um, and one of the effects uh, of the hydroxychloroquine is it glycosylates that and prevents it. This was in, based on in vitro studies, of course, this is the this is a fever curve from one of the pa one of my patients. I just wanted to show you this black line. If you could see it, is uh, the the line between febrile febrile and not, and you could see this the blue line is where I started this patient on hydroxychloroquine, and you could see febrile 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 started the medi medication here and no more fevers. This this patient actually had a remarkable. Um, turnaround. Again, these aren't clinical trial results. I'm just showing you, uh, you know, what based on my experience and experience from people uh, who we share patient, patients with or talk to. Um, just briefly, this, I, I think this is just uh, uh, as an aside, uh, there are known genetic polymorphisms of, of the ACE gene of, for that receptor where this virus binds. This was a Japanese paper looking at the ACE2 receptor, specifically in coronaviruses. This is several years ago. This wasn't regarding um, this epidemic, this pandemic. But it did show that patients with certain polymorphisms of that receptor 
um, had a significantly higher risk of going into ARDS and mortality. And by the way, I was, uh, I was telling you earlier that the two patients who I had who didn't do well, despite starting hydroxychloroquine, those were brother and sister. So it's, um, it's, you know, it's an interesting case. So some, just some clinical summary points, and I won't belabor this talk too much longer. Poor prognostic indicators, again, high LDH, ferritin, CRP, D-dimer, neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio. Uh, imaging modalities to think about um, on plain film, you'll see often bilateral per peripheral uh, patchy ground glass opacities. Pleural effusions are uncommon. They're seen in about 13% of cases, but they're, they're not very common. Um, Washington State, uh, this New England Journal paper actually showed no, no pleural effusions in its series of 24 critically ill patients. Um, CT, can, CT scans, again, are good for maybe academic purposes, but if you can avoid it, if you can do a, um, an ultrasound or review a, a chest film properly, I would suggest uh, avoiding it. This is an x-ray from somebody with COVID. Again, not very striking. You have to look a little bit. The radiologist probably will read more into this than I can. But uh, again, patchy, uh, not ground glass infiltrates here in the, in the periphery. No effusions. You can see the heart border here very clearly. Let's look at the CT scan. And this is really why the CT scan is, has been diagnostically really remarkable. Up here in panel A is a normal CT scan. And down, down below is what you see with a COVID case. And this is the kind of peripheral brown glass shape that you see right, right down here in, uh, in the bottom of panel B in both of them. These usually develop, at, it's estimated for, for based on studies from days three to six, something like that. As far as treatment, uh, antibiotics, so I, we would suggest not to use empiric vancomycin really because of the, because of the complications with the patients often go through renal failure and not to complicate the picture. We really don't see superimposed pneumonias at presentation. Not only do we not see it, the data doesn't show it, uh, perhaps later. If you're really concerned about MRSA, uh, consider using linazolid instead. Procalcitonin is a very useful uh, inflammatory marker and it will it'll be useful if it's negative. It's often negative in patients with COVID. It's, it's not like regular bacterial pneumonias will be very high. Again, Plaquenil and azithromycin do suggest it in high-risk groups. One of the benefits, people wonder, well, why azithromycin? Well, other than uh, the issue of, you know, azithromycin for uh, bacterial pneumonia coverage, it also has anti-inflammatory effects. Uh, azithromycin is also processed through the same CYP enzyme in the liver, so it has an effect of boosting Plaquenil levels. I should say you should be mindful of QT, QT intervals, Q, corrected QTC intervals. Uh, we've had so far two patients who we had to stop uh, Plaquenil azithro because their QTC was, these were otherwise normal patients who had uh, prolonged QTCs. Both of these medications do prolong the QTC. Um, alternative, of course, is you can use ceftriaxone or do ceftriaxone and azithro if you think there's a community acquired pneumonia here or just do no antibiotics. That's okay. You don't always have to throw on antibiotics. Avoid steroids, as I mentioned earlier, for fluid retention issues, immunosuppression as well. Contraindications, I just mentioned this, uh, QT prolongation. Of course, there's other issues, G6PD deficiency, which many of us won't know about, myasthenia, porphyria, epilepsy. But in these sort of situations, it's, it's uh, life or death generally. So use clinical judgment. Uh, again, some issues, this is probably more for folks in the hospital, um, but be very cautious about fluid, uh, fluid balance with these patients because they can easily go into ARDS. Uh, you may see folks who come in with elevated lactate that may be from a catecholamine surge and not from uh, straight sepsis. So if somebody's not 
hypotensive um, and they're having elevated lactate, don't think about just bolusing, bolusing as you would, you know, regularly with uh, otherwise, with, you know, bacterial infections and regular sepsis that we're all used to. Um, think, think about actually even giving some Lasix, taking some fluid off. And this is based on um, studies. Shock at presentation is, is rare. It's, uh, if they do come in in, in straight shock, uh, really dig and try to see if this is a late stage infection. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Dr. Melikian and Dr. Kojaolanyan for these great presentations. Um, again, there, uh, like, there, there are some questions regarding CME and CDE. Uh, you may visit our website and uh, the instructions for claiming those CME and CDE credits are there.